July 1943. The largest tank battle in history is taking place in the vicinity of Kursk. In it, hundreds of Soviet and German armored vehicles are facing off in the ultimate battle, which will clearly decide the future outcome of the war. One of these panzers was commanded by Rudolf von Ribbentrop, who was in charge of a company of panzers four of the Leibstander division, this being our protagonist today. This division, along with other Waffen-SS divisions such as Das Reich and Totenkopf, had made up the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, and during the first days of the offensive during Operation Citadel, they had advanced the most. Commanded by General Paul Hauser, the three elite divisions of the Waffen-SS had managed to break through to the vicinity of Prokhorovka by the night of July 11th, they being the vanguard of the German army. From this point on, it would be very difficult for them to continue advancing, since their flanks were unprotected. On the other hand, a real avalanche of Soviet armored vehicles were about to fall on them, attacking them with a ferocity rarely seen. During the night of July 11th, the Germans occupied their new positions and reorganized to attack during the following day. However, his Soviet enemy was preparing to do exactly the same. Thus, in the early hours of July 12th, this was the situation and location of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps. On the left flank, the Totenkopf Division was located on the banks of the Sel River. In the center we have the Leib Standard, just above the railroad tracks that started from Prokhorovka to the south, and finally the Das Reich Division that was located on the right flank, a little further south than the Leib Standard. It is estimated that between the three divisions they had just over 200 tanks of all kinds, the most numerous being Panzers III and IV with long barrels, and only seven Tiger-type armored vehicles are included. One of them, right in the center with the Live Standard Division, was commanded by Michael Whitman, whose unit of four Tigers would destroy up to 60 Soviet armored vehicles throughout the battle. On the other hand, the Soviet forces are estimated at about 650 or 700 battle tanks of all kinds, mainly T-34, framed mainly in the 5th Armored Army of the Guard. The Soviet generals had set July 12 to launch their great attack on the German vanguard, and had as their objective the destruction of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps, and the halting of the German advance. Right in the middle of all these forces was the small company of the 22-year-old Lieutenant Rudolf von Ribbentrop who, as his name suggests, was the son of the German foreign minister. The Soviet attack began around 10 o'clock in the morning, parallel to the railway line that went down from Prokhorovka. Suddenly, they came across a small German battalion belonging to the Leibstandard division that was a little further ahead. These soldiers quickly launched some purple flares, which served to warn the rearguard troops that a Soviet armored attack was on the way. German Lieutenant von Ribbentrop was the closest to the area and had a unit of seven Panzer IVs. Without having any idea of the magnitude of the Soviet offensive, Ribbentrop approached the area with the intention of giving support to German soldiers and stopped the Soviet offensive. This unit was exhausted after many days of heavy fighting but could do nothing but continue fighting. When Ribbentrop reached the top of the hill with the seven Panzers, he was completely horrified to see what was coming at him, because the whole plane was covered by Soviet tanks. Thus, and with little time to react, Ribbentrop gave the order to open fire against a group of about 20 T-34s that were approaching his hill, and that were at a distance of about 800 meters. Although they were able to shoot down a few enemy armor, Ribbentrop began to see more and more enemy columns, which were going to completely crush them. In his diary, the young German lieutenant noted the following. Suddenly, just 150 to 200 meters from me, 15 enemy tanks appeared, then 30 and then 40. Finally, there were too many to count. After a few first shots with which the Germans surprised the Soviets, the armored vehicles of the Red Army began to respond to fire and a fierce fight began, in which the tanks of both adversaries were shot down equally. The fight was at a very short distance, just 100 and 150 meters, and the young German lieutenant lost three of his panzer in a few minutes. Because he was in a very advanced position, and the losses suffered, Ribbentrop was forced to withdraw towards the area where the bulk of his division was with his remaining four panzers, while being pursued by about 130 enemy tanks. 
However, he did not have time to do so, because when he started this withdrawal action he was already surrounded. According to what Ribbentrop told in his memoirs, during this desperate combat he managed to shoot down about three or four Soviet armored vehicles at less than 30 meters away. Finding himself cut off and low on ammunition and fuel, Ribbentrop was forced to break out of the encirclement if he was to have any chance of saving himself and move into a more defensible position with the bulk of the Leibstander division. One of the main problems with these four German panzers, in addition to the ones just described, was that there was a very deep anti-tank ditch between them and the rest of their division. This ditch was part of the defensive device that the Soviets had established around Kursk, and there were hardly any points to cross it. This task of searching for a crossing point was exactly what the Soviets were doing, who were suffering huge casualties after receiving German fire from the other side of the anti-tank ditch. Once Ribbentrop saw that it was going to be impossible to cross this obstacle, he had to camouflage himself next to some destroyed Soviet armored vehicles, and it was there that he set up his ambush. Truthfully, the only thing he could do was continue fighting, and such a trap was the best he could do. Coincidentally and luckily for him, on the other side of the ditch were some German soldiers under the command of Paper, who had several Pac-40 anti-tank guns. After contacting them by radio, this German anti-tank crew was going to give them the best possible protection. This being the situation, hell broke loose on them again when a new group of Soviet armored vehicles ran into them by chance, and a very short distance confrontation began between the tanks, added also to the anti-tank guns that fired from distance. When the fight ended, Ribbentrop only had two panzers left, although he was able to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviets, who ended up withdrawing. After having lost the hill where Ribbentrop had started the battle, this being known as Elevation 252, in the afternoon said position was back in German hands. It is estimated that his initial company of seven Panzer IVs finished off 14 T-34 Soviets during the morning of July 12th, in a completely chaotic situation. If we add up the casualties that occurred during the July 12th, we have to indicate that the 5th Guard Tank Army lost about 400 armored vehicles, while the Germans had about 100 panzers killed. However, both the Germans and the Soviets were able to recover around 35% of their losses after carrying out the corresponding repairs. Returning now to Ribbentrop, we have to indicate that this intrepid action helped him to be awarded the Knight's Cross, which he always proudly displayed from that day on. Years later, Ribbentrop said that he was able to survive that desperate fight because the Soviet armor was still very poorly directed, and tremendously clumsy. On the other hand, they had a training, direction, and discipline far superior to that of their enemy. Months later, Ribbentrop was present at the Battle of Normandy and the Bulge. After the war, he dedicated himself to selling wine, and died just four years ago, on May 20, 2019 at the age of 98, being one of the last veterans of the Battle of Kursk. And well, here is this program about Lieutenant Von Ribbentrop in the Battle of Prokhorovka, which I hope you liked. If you want to expand this information, and you would like to see all the evolution of the combats on the southeastern front of 1943, I leave said documentary in the description. Thank you all so much for being part of this community, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you as always every Wednesday and Sunday, see you soon.